you mentioned isolated, like a protein supplement. And now that you talk about slowing down the kind of rate of digestion, this, this gets me thinking about protein supplements and isolated proteins and whether are they, are they similar to a refined carbohydrate where if you're ingesting a protein shake, there's no food matrix as such, or it's a different food matrix, I should say, that those amino acids are just going to be rapidly absorbed into circulation and have much less effect on hunger potentially than if you're getting that protein with fiber and in a food that is digested much slower. Well, so th this is the whey versus casein question. So whey is very rapidly digested. And so you see this big spike in amino acids and they come down more quickly. With casein, it's more slowly digested. And so you see this more gradual rise and fall in amino acids. And, you know, in particular, uh, certain amino acids are more um, key with regard to stimulating muscle protein synthesis. And so that's what people are usually interested in when they're doing those kinds of studies. And so when it comes to appetite, I don't think we have a great understanding of this, but the one thing we do have a reasonably good understanding of is you've got more of these L cells down lower in the small intestine. So if you digest your protein very quickly and you absorb all the amino acids and then you get down to where a lot of the L cells are, then you don't have the amino acids and the peptides um, that are released with protein digestion to stimulate those L cells. So I do think that when people are taking protein supplements, um, that at least theoretically it might be better to consume them, say, with a viscous fiber, at least when it comes to appetite. Now, when it comes to muscle protein synthesis, now that, that's a different question and that's kind of not my main area of expertise. But, um, you know, I, I think there is a lot of information that we need to learn about timing. And I think the current U.S. diet is very low in fiber, very high in rapidly digestible sources of carbohydrate and protein. And so, you know, we're probably not utilizing our intestines in the way that they sort of evolved to be utilized. Um, because if you look at hunter-gatherer types of diets, they're very high in fiber, high in protein as well. And right. so, you know, maybe we're that, making it harder for yeah, ourselves. Maybe that we're adapted to a different kind of diet than the average American is eating now. So the idea being when you are potentially when you're consuming a lot of these more refined foods, that appetite dysregulation is more likely to occur where you get that hunger gap. Yeah. And another element of that is speed of eating. So it takes some time for these mechanisms to kick in and produce satiety. And so when you gobble down a meal in 10 minutes, you still want more because those mechanisms haven't kicked in. And so slowing down is one thing and then adding more volume to the meal. So Barbara Rolls, volumetrics, has this idea that energy density is important. I think she's right about that. And so if we consume foods that have higher fiber content, they will have lower energy density. It will take longer to consume them. And so I think a lot of these things work together. And so when we talk about protein, fiber, and exercise, um, you know, on the protein, there are effects on appetite. On the fiber, there are effects on appetite. And I think there is an interaction there. But also with the fiber, you're reducing uh, energy density, which is the number of calories per, say, 100 grams of food consumed. And so you get that volume effect as well. So I think all of those things are contributing to the hypothesized benefits. Um, again, we're in the planning stages of the study. We haven't done the study yet, but we, we expect that based on the evidence we have, we're optimistic that we'll have better results. It's not like you've plucked these things out of thin air. There's a body of evidence that's informed this intervention that you've put together. The, the simple framework, 30 grams of protein, 
per meal, 30 grams of fiber per day, 30 minutes of exercise per day. There's some more details that we, we might get into if, if we have time. This episode is proudly brought to you by 38 Terra. Try 38 Terra's DMN Prebiotic, the science-based daily multivitamin for your gut microbes, a simple and delicious way to take your gut health to the next level. Now back in stock in new and improved packaging for customers living in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Get 10% off your DMN at 38terra.com using the code THEPROOF. That's 38TERA.com and use the coupon code THEPROOF for 10% off. While, while we're on Barbara Rolls, her book Volumetrics is a, a book that I, you know, I recommend all the time. I think it's a, a great read. If she was sitting here, and I'm not 100% sure what her position is on, on protein now, but I see people citing one of her studies, um, Garth Davis, Dr. Garth Davis, who uh, I enjoy his content online. He often cites her work and says, you know, she conducted a study where participants, I think it was healthy women, um, we've spoken about it, so I think you're familiar with this paper, um, where they kind of hid varying amounts of protein in these meals and fed you know, a meal that had 5% protein or 10%, 15, 20, 25%, I think, uh, to the subjects without them knowing how much protein was in the meals and then was recording uh, how many, because they, they told them just to eat until you're satisfied and they tracked their calories they ate across the day. So they're tracking total amount of energy they consumed and then like hunger and satiety. And that study, at least what they reported, was there was no significant difference in satiety or hunger despite these varying uh, sort of amounts of protein in these meals that subjects were unaware of. And so people point to that and say, see, protein doesn't really make much of a difference. And what I would say is a couple of things. One is it seems to be a bit of a threshold effect and maybe the threshold differs from person to person a bit, but again, we see it every time we've gone to at least 30 grams of protein in a meal. And then the second thing is that I think I described a study that we did. We were looking at an intervention that had an impact on satiety, and we did the intervention. I can't talk about exactly what it was. Did the intervention, and at lunch... You know, so people felt more full before lunch. At lunch, they consumed fewer calories. Um, it wasn't a huge amount. It was, you know, say 64 calories or something like that. And then lo and behold, at dinner, the people who got the intervention consumed exactly 64 calories more at dinner. They completely compensated for it at the next meal. So I think that there are are a lot of variables and uh, in any one study, you know, you can only control a certain number of them. We do have evidence that in weight loss trials, those with higher protein, um, people tend to lose more weight. It's not a huge effect, but it's there. With higher fiber, people tend to lose more weight and meta-analyses have shown this. And so what we're saying is we're going to combine two things that have been associated with more weight loss. And then exercise has been associated with more weight loss. We're going to combine three things um, that are associated with more weight loss, hoping that by dealing with both sides of the energy balance equation, intake by influencing appetite and expenditure through exercise, but there are also effects of protein and fiber on energy expenditure, which I can go into a bit. We're going to be dealing with both sides of that energy balance equation and narrow that gap between the hunger that's driving you to eat a certain number of calories and the energy expended.